The Greatest Revival Ever, Part 6. The Word, Teaching with Authority. The whole of this series is based on Mark chapter 1, which begins, The Beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And today's section is based on the foundational scriptures, Mark 1, 21 to 22. Then they went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So he was teaching the word in the authority of revelation, not as the scribes. Today we're talking about how to see the great revival. Part one was warning and prophetic preparation. Part two, worship a fresh surrender. Part three was the wilderness for warfare against the wimp, which Jesus won with the word and returned in the power, clothed in the power. Part four, he began to give witness to the truth, preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Part five, we looked at last time, walking with Jesus, that Jesus said to us, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, be my disciple, which is on the job training, as well as classroom training. And then it's make disciples. And today's part is part six, the living word, teaching, and you could add preaching with authority. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, we're asking for a supernatural impartation of grace and wisdom and your spirit of wisdom and revelation to allow us to see what's in the word, showing us how to apply it. And Father, we're asking you to impart the grace that we may live it so that we can see the great revival here now. Remembering, of course, throughout this series, the theme has been on the greatest revival ever, which was the visitation of Jesus to this planet, God coming into manifestation, God becoming tangible, present to people's touch, always accompanied by great signs and wonders and healing, anointed teaching. There was huge crowds, lots of love, lots of celebration, lots of life and joy and people flocking, great crowds coming. So this is the revival we're talking about. It's where sin is turned away from. Repentance, remember, is the first word Jesus preached. Then as we progress through Mark, we see the great results of the revival of his manifest presence coming into tangible reality on the earth as found in Mark 1.33, where it says all the city, not just the church, not just the local churches, but the whole city was gathered together at the door. Verse 37, they said to him, all men are seeking you, which is a lot different from just going to a meeting or going because they like the crowd or they like someone there or they're going to see so-and-so or maybe they like the music or the lights. They're going to seek Jesus. Then in verse 45, it says, he couldn't openly enter the city, but was outside in desert places and they came to him from every direction of the compass. This is beyond the city. And then when you get to John chapter 12, verse 19, it says the whole world has gone after him. This is the revival God wants to see here. He wants to see it where you are, in your family, in your town, in your church. He wants to see that revival in your city. He wants to see that revival in the nation. He wants to see that revival across the whole world for the huge ingathering of the end time harvest. And this is what we want to see now. And we've been looking at how do we see this? And we can see this great revival here, I believe, if we give our focus to what God's Word says in the foundation scripture and the other ones that relate to it in the Bible. If we give our attention, we will see it in here, see the steps, see how it worked, and then we'll see how to apply it. And I believe, too, if you give your attention, focus in on the worship we've been doing and repeat the worship Listen to the messages over and over. The Spirit of God, by His grace, will empower you to live it. Amen? So, after heeding the prophetic word, surrendering in worship to the Father's will, overcoming the enemy in your wilderness, 
then returning in power, beginning to be a witness, and after being yoked to Jesus as a disciple, who then makes disciples in the overflow, number one today, this is talking about teaching with authority, Jesus is the living word of God. That is profound. And I pray by the end of this session that you will receive such an amazing revelation of this truth that your life will never be the same. Jesus is the living word of God. And when I say that, I'm not taking anything away from Jesus, the son of God, the son of Mary and Joseph, the son of man, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of Adam, the Jesus that we worship, Jesus who died on the cross. We're not taking anything away from the person of Jesus, both man and God. But what we're doing is we're adding to our own understanding of how powerful the word of God is when it comes alive in us through meditation and study and confession and praise and listening. When that word comes alive, this is what we've got to see, that the word of God is God. You know, the Bible says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. The same as in the beginning with God, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And the word became flesh. Jesus is the living word of God. And the word became flesh. Now, this is talking about Jesus, visitation, intangible manifestation on this planet. Amen. The living word of God became a man. This is what we see in operation in Jesus. Then in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4 says, that which was from the beginning, so there's the eternal aspect, which we have heard, so it's manifestation, this is tangibility, which our eyes have seen, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. Now John, of course, was an eyewitness to all of Jesus' ministry. He knew him as a friend. He leaned on his chest at the Last Supper. And so he could say this, we've been through this experience where the word of the living God was Jesus coming into tangible manifestation. And he says, we have heard him, we've seen him, we've looked on him and our hands have handled. And he is the word of life or the life giving word or the word that's full of life or the word that imparts life, brings us life, overflows in life. Amen. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. According to John 6, 63, verse 2 of 1 John 1, the life was manifested. That's revival right there. That's exactly what we've been talking about. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. All these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is another aspect of revival. It's joy, it's life, it's grace, it's transformation, it's sweatless holiness, it's God's righteousness invading our old life and transforming and getting rid of stuff off our lives. This is is what God wants to do in us next. Amen. In the way of illustration for this, I'm thinking of a time when we're all first Christians, our whole band got saved. We were in the lounge room praying. And for some reason, because I'd had a background in Christianity, I seemed to be able to lead in some of these spiritual things initially because the others didn't know scriptures like I did. And so we we're all praying. And then suddenly I remembered this scripture and I said, the Bible says where two or three gather in Jesus name that he is there in the midst of them. And one of the guys sitting on the couch, I can still picture this. He started to lean to one side and he said, yes, he's here with us. I can feel him. So I said, move over and give him space. And that night I stayed up praying till 630 in the morning, right through the night, because Jesus was tangible. He was present. There was a revival right in my house. 
and it wasn't long before we had home group going and people came from everywhere. We had a constant move of people getting saved. There were healings, there were exorcisms. There was a great move of God, new friendships were formed. And we've been in contact with some of those people that are still on fire for God today. Amen. They're still following God. And I'll never forget those days. You too can have revival right there in your house, among your family, in amongst your friends, because the Spirit of God is ready and willing to move. Amen. And one time I got together with our band and some of our other friends and the sound guy, and we went up to the sound guy's house in Belgrave, and we decided to pray in the new year. So we prayed between Christmas and New Year's. Initially, we were going to do prayer and fasting during the day and fun and feasting at night. But after about one night meal, that lost its appeal completely. And we prayed and we prayed into that new year until I went to the throne room. It was such an amazing encounter. And Jesus was tangible right there with us. That was revival. And we've seen revival in our church when everybody was so moved by the Holy Spirit, they came to the front spontaneously and began to confess their sins and the righteousness of God drove the sin addiction right out of their lives. Then it happened again in another one of our churches over in Sunshine. Then it happened as we were leading the Bible college at the Gold Coast. It happened again and again in our Bible college camps that we used to go on. This is revival and this is what God wants to bring on a huge scale not only in church not only in our homes but till it overflows into the world like some of the revivals and awakenings of past years amen where the people coming in on ships would be so convicted under the power of God that when they got near the port they would fall on the deck and begin to repent of their sins because of the hovering glory and God has promised us as surely as I live, says the Lord, the whole earth will be filled with the glory of God. And in another scripture, it says the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. And I believe that the glory is going to be so intense and so thick that there will be such miracles that people can't stop talking about them until they know. And everyone that believes them and trusts them and knows them will also know that there is a living God who loves them, who loves people, and the darkness will be moved. As we spoke about a few years ago, the spirit of death and of Antichrist will be parted and the glory of God is going to visit so strongly that there will be such revival. There will be evangelism and salvation and healings and people getting right, people coming to wholeness, People whose lives you thought could never change will suddenly be the main praise leaders. Amen. They will be leading the praise everywhere they go. Their life will be filled with praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is great. And they will love God with a passion that's been unequaled in our experience. Amen. This is God's plan for the future. And I'm encouraging you today, have your life ready so that when this revival gets stronger and stronger, you're not on your knees needing to deal with all your life, that you've already done that and you're ready to help others and to pray for them and to lead them and to lead groups and to lead people into the greatest freedom that they never knew could even exist and lead them right into the throne of God so that they can receive grace to help them in their time of need. Amen. So number one today, the living word of God is God. Number two, the living word of God has all authority. Mark 1.22, they are astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Can you see what I'm saying? He didn't just walk in with a look on his face and they were astonished at his authority. Man, this guy walks with authority. The carpet smolders behind him, you know. Even the air parts out of his way when he walks through. No, it didn't say that. It's when he was teaching that they marveled at his authority. He taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. And I imagine the scribes were probably good theologians and they probably could quote from the Talmud and all their commentaries and knew the scriptures off. But when Jesus spoke from revelation from his father, 
They knew this was different. And they made the comments afterwards, what a word is this? For with power and authority, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. They marveled, they were astonished at the authority of Jesus' words. Amen. And in Nazareth, it says they wondered at his gracious words. Then in Matthew chapter 28, 18, after rising from the dead, Jesus came and spoke to his disciples and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You know, Jesus, the living word of God, has all authority. You can see where this is headed. Amen. So this is great news that Jesus has authority. Does this benefit us? Does this mean we have to talk Jesus into using that authority? Or is there some way he set up a system for us to benefit from that authority? So how does it work for us here and now? All right, let's move along. We're going to follow this through. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 118, Jesus said, I am he who lives, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of of hell and death. Now we know that's about Jesus, but that motivate us today, let's also remember that this is about Jesus, the living word of God. He has the keys of hell and death. Well, first of all, that means the devil doesn't have the key of hell and or death. Amen. Keys can lock or unlock. They can allow or prevent people from entering or leaving. Keys can keep things safe and keys can open the way for removing them. And so Jesus has those keys with hell. Amen. He has the keys of hell and death. I know the thief came to steal, to kill and destroy, and he's operating illegally when he perpetrates death on people because Jesus has all authority. That means the word has all authority and that word can save us from death because death and life are in the power of the tongue. They're not in the devil. The devil has to train us to say things for us to die at the wrong time. Amen. So Jesus' authority is absolute. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. It says he is upholding all things. You know, in him we live and move and have our being. He's upholding all things. By the word of his power. That's absolute. That's everything. You can't get more absolute than everything. Amen. He's upholding it all by the word of his power. Amen. That's the authority of the word right there. So this passage is about his current ministry. His word has the authority and the power to uphold everything. No wonder having that word come alive releasing what Jesus once said in his name can change the way things are because it's a greater power than physics and chemistry and gravity and all the natural laws. It's upholding all of those natural laws. And so it's like in the old days, they thought there was an ether, something out there. Now they say space is full of nothing, but it's all held up by the word of God by Jesus' all-authoritative word. And when we speak that word, it can shape and change the natural course of events because it's the greater reality that holds them all together. Amen? Gravity only works because of Jesus' word. Light only keeps coming because of Jesus' word, etc., etc. No wonder there's authority and power there to keep us alive to bring healing, to bring provision, to bring peace, to overcome the enemy, etc. Jesus' word featured powerfully all the way through his ministry. Amen. It seems that Jesus did virtually everything he did by speaking. With words, he calmed storms, cast out demons, taught and preached. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He enabled Peter to walk on water with one word. Come. Amen. He empowered Peter to catch a fish with a coin in its mouth. I love that. That is so amazing, isn't it? Go fishing with a rod, you know, angling. Go fishing and the first fish will have a coin in its mouth. If he said first, that could imply there were many more fish, but the first one had a coin in its mouth. 
With Jesus' words, he killed a fig tree, he called disciples, he communicated love and forgiveness until the historian Josephus said, whether he's man or God or angel, I don't know. But one thing I do know that he seems to achieve everything he does with his words. Amen. His word is all authoritative, all powerful, and everything is upheld by it. There is no greater authority than the word of God. Amen. His words build a highway of holiness for his future. When he said things like, Lazarus isn't dead, he's sleeping, but I go to wake him up. He said over himself, I'm going to be killed, but on the third day I'll rise again. And just before he died, he said, now is the son of man glorified, just as he was about to be shamed or ridiculed, spat upon, buffeted, crown of thorns, whipped, mocked, false trial, false arrest, and crucified. Before that, he said, now is the son of man glorified. He was speaking of things that haven't happened yet, and it created the highway for his future. In the book of Isaiah, it's called the highway of holiness. And included in all of that, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Amen. Let's put this into practice by making sure we're full of that word and have our full trust in it. So what have we learned? Number one, Jesus is the living word. Number two, the living word has all authority in heaven and on earth. Number three today, all authority is in the living word of God. So give him your priority. Jeremiah 1.12 says, You have seen well, for I will watch over my word to perform it. God has obligated himself to making his word good. You know, every time we take those communion emblems, when Jesus first instituted it, he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. It's shed for the remission of sin so that we can have this covenant for us. We can receive that forgiveness. We can receive the new birth if we haven't yet received it. Forgiveness for all sins. And that way we have free and clear access to Father and we can operate in this authority. Amen. All we need then is to get a revelation of the word of God. And when we speak it, we release it, we say it, we pray it, we sing it, we shout it, we do it. And of course, you've got to take it to heart. You've got to sow it in there sometimes. You've got to get pregnant with it sometimes if it's a dream and a vision. But it will grow to a harvest. It will overflow. And when the living word comes out of your mouth, it comes out in Jesus' name. And Father will watch over his word to perform it. This is done by the Holy Spirit and the angels, etc. Amen. It's like Esther going before the king. If the king held out his scepter, she could ask her request. When she asked, all she needed was one nod from the king saying, request granted. And the whole future of the Jewish race changed from that moment. And it's the same as us coming before God. We're looking for the living word of God. And when we get before God, we revolve the word of God over in our mind. We wait on God. We praise him. We confess the word. But when it comes alive, we've got a word from God that's just as sure as a court order from the courts of heaven. And the angels will enforce it. God watches over that word to bring it to pass. Not a word that I try to work up myself. Not my own words. His word. Amen. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. She gave Jesus her priority. She gave listening to the word and relating to him her priority. This is found in Luke chapter 10 verses 39 to 42. Martha had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now, it goes on to say that Martha was in the kitchen. She was trying to serve everybody. She had a misplaced priority on the day, even though it seems like such a noble, humble and serving thing. And when she came in, she misprayed, prayed a fake prayer when she said, Lord, my sister left me to serve alone. Tell her to help me. And Jesus would have nothing to do with that prayer. And this is what he said to her. He said, one thing is needed. This is a statement for eternity for all of us. One thing is 
is needed and Mary has chosen that good part. So there's one thing needed and it's a choice. Eternal statement of absolute truth. And Jesus said, which will not be taken away from her. This is amazing. We need to make sure that our priority is given to the word of God, because getting a word from God and having the word come alive in you is an unsubstitutable and infinitely authoritative, irresistible power that cannot be stopped and God will fulfill it. This is more significant than anything else in the whole of our lives. Amen. Jesus gave two key parables to drive this point home. And they're found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 46. There's the pearl of great price and the treasure hidden in a field. Listen to what Jesus said about his kingdom. And remember, kingdoms run by kings speaking. I know when David was younger, he ran by example, but kings usually reign by speaking. And Jesus certainly gave us his example. But this is what he's saying. We've got to be attentive to the word of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. That is to seek first God speaking. Amen. Listen to what he says. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So in both parables, you've got someone finding what's truly valuable to them. Now, this is a picture. We need to find our pearl of great price, the treasure that we need to find is a revelation of just what the Word of God can do when it comes alive in and through us. Both of them sold everything and bought the field, bought the pearl. Both of them rearranged their whole life, which included selling, changing, giving up things they'd worked for, things they'd stockpiled. They gave it all up for the one treasure that's eternal, that eclipses all else. And in these stories, these people didn't just go down to cash converters and get some money for it. They didn't take it down to the pawnbroker shop and exchange it for some quick cash. They had to do a lot of work to get themselves set up, but they both made sure they were set up in such a way, one of them bought the pearl and the other one bought the treasure hidden in the field because they knew that nothing else in life was of anywhere near equal value to finding and owning the great treasure, which we need to understand is what Jesus said to Mary. He said, one thing is needful and Mary has chosen it. Amen. The two men chose to sell up their stuff, change their whole lifestyle for what they considered treasure. And I believe that he's talking here about this treasure. Another illustration for this, which I think is a real clincher for this, is found in the feeding of the 5,000, which, of course, the story of that happened a couple of times and it's repeated in the New Testament. In one story, he wanted a day off. He went out into the country and the people heard that he was out there and they rushed out to him. Now, it's an interesting story because we know that they didn't have sufficient food. So they hadn't planned to be out there for three days at this word conference. That means if they hadn't planned food, they probably hadn't planned the rest of their life either. Like who's milking the goat? Who's running the shop? Who's feeding the animals? Who's watching over the business? They just dropped it all and ran to where Jesus was. And they didn't even have food for their children. And after three days, note the Bible does not say, you irresponsible people, how dare you drop your responsibilities? How dare you not bring food for your children or for yourself? You're all going to faint on the way home. He doesn't say that. Jesus instead said this. He said, They've chosen the good part, which is to sit at Jesus' feet and listen to his word, and it will not be taken away from them. Amen. And Jesus, instead of telling them off for dropping what the rest of us would consider 
important responsibilities. They didn't keep their appointments, you know, they didn't go to work, whatever they were normally doing. Instead of rebuking them, he fed them as if to say, I'm putting my seal on what you've done because you've chosen to go for the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in the field, the one thing that is needful. Amen. So I want to encourage you today, prioritize sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing his word. Rearrange whatever it takes in life to make this happen. You might be saying, I'm too busy. Then you are too busy. You might be saying, I've got to be out there and do this and do that. When Peter left his fishing boat to follow Jesus, he didn't say to Jesus, I can't, I've got to feed my family. Jesus took care of that. And this is some place you've got to come to between you and God. And you've got to know that you know what God is saying. And you've got to sit at his feet, drink in his word, prioritize it and you will receive the call that God has on your life. It will be quickened to you and you will come under the impact of the Holy Spirit, bringing grace to fulfill the call of God. And you can walk out into this revival and fulfill your part in it. And remember, this is crucially important to God. It's his business. It's his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and all of the things will be added to you because God is not a man that doesn't pay wages. Amen. He says those that reap a harvest will earn wages. God will meet your every need. Rosanna and I did this 40 years ago this year. 40 years ago, we were gainfully employed in the music industry. The call of God came. We started to follow him and industry work dried up because they realized we weren't helping them and outreach started. And in between, we just had to believe God and learn to live by faith. And I did a few odd jobs in that time. It was it was all right. I put up a few library shelves. I helped shift some furniture. Again, the band took a while to regroup fully. And then when we got going, we played in schools and outreaches. We had to use the faith we learned in the downtime in our own personal lockdown when there was no visible income. We had to use the faith we generated there to keep us going. Amen. And we've been living on that faith ever since. As I keep saying, this iPad, the camera we're filming through, the car that's on the other side of that wall, our musical instruments, Rosanna's jackets you see her wearing, it all came the same way, by faith in God. And our faith hasn't taken a holiday. We're still believing. We're still believing. Amen. And right at the beginning, we had to sell what we had, give the money to the poor. He said, come follow me. And we literally sold our band equipment and we believed it in ever since. We kept believing it in. One not we believed in. They told us, no, this came into the church. It's a church's equipment. We had to let that go and believe for ourselves and believe over years and years. But now the equipment keeps coming. Coming. Amen. Because what you sow is what you reap. And when you give yourself first to seeking God and his kingdom, prioritize sitting at the feet of Jesus, he will meet your needs. Amen. So how can we see the great revival here now? Remember, Jesus is the living word. The living word has all authority. So give him your priority. And number four, the living word has resurrection power. I won't pause on this very long, but Jesus was crucified in the place of the skull. You know, literally Golgotha, the place of the skull. Sometimes the living word comes alive. We get a word from God. It can be crucified up here, especially when we go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to try to reason out, dragging into the intellectual realm, something that's a faith promise which needs to be incubated. It needs to be sown. It needs to be loved and nurtured and believed until it comes to pass. Amen. You know, sometimes I'm playing one of those word games on my phone and it's got all the letters there. You've got to make words out of it. And sometimes I tried all the different words. Okay, what if it starts with W-E something L, W-E something else L. But there are other times I just stare at all those letters and bang, a word comes to me. And it's usually one that puts them all in. It's been amazing. But that's exactly how the word of God works. 
Yes, you can analyze it, you can study it, but don't overlook meditating in the Word of God where you fix your attention on a passage, revolving it in your mind, thinking about it, picturing it, looking at those words one at a time, making sure you can see every word that's there. And in that process, even though it doesn't come from the intellectual realm, the revelation can come of what God is saying to you at that moment and how the scripture fits with another one. A teaching can come, a preaching, a promise for the future, a promise about your family, a healing promise. All kinds of things can come by that process. We must not overlook it. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word, taking him in, drinking him in. Remember, Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come unto me and drink. And if we do crucify him in the place of the skull, he's got the power of resurrection life. Amen. Number five today, all authority is in the living word of God. So go and teach him. Go and preach. Amen. Matthew 28, 18 to 19 says, Jesus spoke to them saying, all authority is given to me. Now to help motivate us, always think me there also applies to the living word of God. That's who was operating through Jesus. And if you're reading the book of Revelation, when he comes back on the white horse, he's called the word of God. And he has an iron scepter with which to rule the nations. It's our responsibility in the church to get that word of God to come alive. Learn how to rule and to reign over circumstances until that word rules and reigns and pulls down dominions, casts down imaginations and drives out the principalities and powers. Amen. All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go and teach. All authority is in the word. Go and teach. All authority is in the word. When he comes alive in you, release him. Overflow that word. Teach others. Let the word of God, that's revelation, come out to others. That's how Jesus functioned. That's how the Christian life works. Amen. And then he says, baptizing them. Baptism for a new Christian is like a symbol of our first step of obedience. It's a symbol that we're under Jesus as Lord, under a different government. And so what we're saying to people is we're putting the word into them as part of discipleship. The other part is being yoked to Jesus. So Jesus says to be baptized. If they do, at least we can see them start the right steps in walking with Jesus. If they balk at that, well, then no matter how much word you give them, they're not really disciples. So it's a good test for them. And it's something good for you to watch. Amen. It's just good to see. And if they get baptized, then you can go on and invest in them and you won't be throwing your pearl to the swine. Amen. In Mark's gospel, of course, Jesus' commission was go into all the world and preach the gospel. So we need to preach the living word of God again. And then Peter helps us understand why. It says in 1 Peter 1.23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word of God is what produces gospel fruit. Amen. He goes on to say, and the Lord was working with and confirming the word with the signs that follow. So we do that. We encourage them to be baptized. If they're baptized, we can go on and become disciple makers with them and teach them the same thing we've been taught, which begins with take my yoke upon you, learn from me. And Jesus said, follow me. Amen. And you'll find rest for your souls. Where's the authority? Let's just repeat this again. The authority is in the living word of God. It's not in me personally, so to speak, even though I have the authority to speak the living word of God. But if I go around speaking my own ideas in my own name, God's not backing that up. That's not backed up by all authority in heaven and earth. This is, in fact, what God says about me in Colossians 3.3. 3, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Paul said, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. So it's not a matter of getting the focus on me. I'm the man of authority. No, I am a humble servant. 
I'm doing what Jesus did. I'm investing in fellowship with the Father, meditating in the Word of God, studying the Word of God, living in the Word of God, and I'm letting the overflow of living Word come out through me because that's where the authority is. Amen. Then it says here about getting that revelation in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 10. As it is written, I has not seen natural eye, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. So we need that close walk with a very holy spirit. We need to walk in holiness to walk in lockstep with him. Amen. And then that word can come alive. And of course, when the word comes alive, he brings life. He brings light. And he also brings faith as many other things come. But that's how faith comes. And Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Go your way. Your faith has made you whole. According to your faith, be it unto you. So faith is available. We all start with the measure of faith. It's a gift of God. And then we grow our faith. The Bible talks of exceedingly growing faith. Amen. In conclusion today, how can we see the great revival here now? After heeding the prophetic warning, after surrendering in worship to Father's will, after overcoming the enemy in your wilderness, returning in the power of the Holy Spirit, after being a witness, and after positioning as his disciple and discipling others. And number six is the living word, teach with authority. Amen. Jesus is the living word. The living word has all authority. We give him our priority. He comes alive in us. Even if we've killed him off in the place of our skull, he can resurrect. And then all authorities in the living word. So go teach and preach. Amen. So let me talk to you again about being born again. Because being born again is the first step. You can't have that kind of relationship with God without being born again. You need to be open to revelation spoken through someone else to receive the gospel. And sometimes God will speak to you, but being born again is absolutely prerequisite to moving forward. And today being born again is as simple as this. You come to Jesus, you confess that your old life was wrong, you make a statement of turning from your old life, and then you receive what Jesus did on the cross. He died for you, he died as you, and then he rose from the dead, proving that your old life is gone, your sin is forgiven and gone, it's just gone. The old you was annihilated and went right out of existence. And with Jesus, the potential for a new you came into being. That's what you get when you get born again. The Bible also says it's becoming a new creation. God created you afresh. The potential's waiting in Jesus. When you make him the Lord of your life, you receive his new birth. That new birth makes you a new creation and the old you whose name was registered in the devil's role disappears, goes out of existence and a new you is recreated with your name in the Lamb's book of life. You're one of Jesus from that point forward. Then you follow him as your good shepherd, walking in his ways, confessing he is your Lord. You follow him through the waters of baptism. You receive his Holy Spirit and then follow him all the way through your life until either you go off to meet him by yourself or we all go off together. But we can show you how to do this right now. Simply pray this prayer after me. And remember, today's the day of salvation and Jesus will not reject anyone who comes to him. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I'm sorry for everything I've done wrong. I turn from my old life. Today, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe that you were raised from the dead. I receive your new birth. I receive you as my saviour. 
I declare that you are now my Lord, Lord Jesus. Thank you that my name's now in the Lamb's Book of Life. And by your grace, I will follow you through the water of baptism and keep following you as my good shepherd, confessing you are my Lord until you take me from this planet and then forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you pray that prayer with me today, you can always go back and play it again. Pray that prayer, and I believe that you are born again right now. It's a change deep on the inside. On the outside, you might look mostly the same, but there'll be a difference about you, and it's coming from the inside. And then it's important that you tell someone. Tell someone you know that's a Christian. Get with other Bible-believing Christians that will pray together. Or if you've got no one to turn to, contact us on Messenger, write to us on YouTube in the comments. We'll see it and be able to respond. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. And let me finish by saying again, eat the word, sleep the word, think the word, say the word, preach the word, pray the word, study the word, memorize the word. You can sing it, shout it, say it and pray it. And the word of God has all authority because the word of God is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the great revival is when the power of that Word and of Jesus, which is the same thing, all in operation by the Holy Spirit, comes into manifestation so that people can see Him, feel, touch, handle, have tangible things like miracles happen in their life, things that they can see and feel and touch and see in other people, this is the revival that God is bringing now and you have a part to play in it. So get busy, prioritize the word of God in your life, put aside everything else and go for the kingdom, go for the treasure and the pearl and God will meet every one of your needs and all of these things will be added to you and you'll be celebrating for all of eternity the great things that God has done in, through and around you. God bless you. Thanks for listening.